I'd like to welcome Sean Engelstad, who is an expert in fine elements. He's made a lot of advances in the area of aerospace structures. Uh, he is doing uh, quite a bit of work in the area of machine learning, in the area of buckling, and advancing techniques using writer writs and other methods. So he's very, very qualified to talk about the use of fine elements for real applications. So in today's uh, presentation, Sean Engelstad will be talking about the application of fine elements for aerospace structures. And before I get started, Sean, you wanna uh, introduce yourself a little bit to my class? Sure, uh, yeah, I'm a, I'm a fifth year fifth year student at Georgia Tech, first year PhD student. And I study like basically aerothermal elastic design of aircraft structures and like structural optimization. So and I also play basketball a lot and uh, I, I just moved here two, day, two days ago from Georgia, so it's pretty exciting. Um, not permanently, just for the summer, but yeah. Thank you very much, Sean. So can you tell us a little bit about how valuable finite elements can be in real applications? Yeah, so one of the main problems in the past of design of aircraft structures is basically that you had to rely on like trying to solve or develop these analytical models or like mathematical equations that predict like different failure modes of the structure, like whether it's buckling failure or stress failure, or these different kinds of failure modes. But they have typically a lot of inaccuracies for a number of reasons. Like you have to simplify the geometry, you have to simplify the like the deflection response of the structure. And so there's a lot of there'll be a lot of error in the analytical models. You have to have huge knockdown factors to make sure that you're not um, causing failure because your model is wrong, basically. And so you end up losing a lot of, you end up making your aircraft look kind of too heavy because your equations are wrong, you know? And so the nice, the main the main utility of, of FEA is that it's, again, it can solve basically any physical problem using basically a numerical analysis technique. And so you can use it, um, you know, it's, it's basically the industry standard for solving structural analysis problems uh, on general, you know, high curvature aircraft structure is just all the complete you know gamut of that so in your opinion uh what what are top errors that you see people commit using finalists have, have you seen people make yeah, errors yeah. and what are those errors that could so the the layman who's just starting to run fea models the trip you typically think you're successful when you okay i ran the model and it ran so i'm good now i got the migration set up i got my elements set up but there's a lot of there's a number of different errors. Like at the end of the day, you're trying to solve the physical PDE problem. The partial differential equation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But but the ideal way is that you would you know check your answer against the true solution of the PDE, but that's not really something you can do a lot of the times. So for example, um, there are certain scenarios where like if you choose the wrong element type, or if your element isn't integrated correctly, like it's you doing full integration or reduced integration, then you'll end up uh, causing the FEA model to become very stiff. And so it will not deflect as much as it actually should. For example, you get shear locking and membrane locking. These things tend to happen when you have very thin plates, for example, for the uh, shear locking. And so if you don't know that, you might choose a, wrong, a slightly wrong element type and you're gonna get the completely wrong answer, so. Thank you, Sean. So uh, let me ask you this. Uh, I believe your research has turned into looking at machine learning as an application. Yeah. And maybe others here may be interested in pursuing a career in machine learning because that's the next hot thing that we're working on these days. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how you view machine learning be useful? Number one, first explain in layman terms, very simple terms, what machine learning is in your opinion, and then go into a discussion of how powerful machine learning could be to solve these next generation problems in structures or thermal or whatever area. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's a lot, again, FEA is the industry standard for doing the numerical analysis on the PDEs, right? But there are certain scenarios where you can't really run um, F, run FEA analysis like with an efficient runtime, it's gonna take too long. For example, buckling is a it's an eigenvalue problem. Uh, it takes a lot longer to run buckling analysis. You definitely cannot run buckling analysis on the whole aircraft, right? Um, it just scales too poorly. So uh, there is still a, a, a kind of a niche area for structural analysis that machine learning can be applied, basically where you can uh, improve the accuracy of your basically design curves like for buckling failure um, by using machine learning surrogate models. And that way you, don't, you, can, you train these surrogate models against a bunch of uh, 
FEA training data where you like ran, you know, single panel uh, failure modes of buckling tapes. And then you can take uh, that, you can take that training data, build the circuit model. And then it's that way you don't have to run a buckling analysis every time you're trying to improve the design or optimize the design. Um, is that the main, that's the main way that I apply it right now. So yeah. Great. Uh, with that said, I will now let you have uh, some time to go through the seminar. Um, and at the end, there's any questions. Uh, this meeting is recorded, so uh, let me know if you're okay with your voice being recorded. But go ahead. Sure. And yes. Speak to so I'm just going to go over a couple examples of from my own research how I apply it, finite element analysis. Oh, wrong button. <laughs> first, the first uh, case is talking about modeling crack growth of uh, sandwich structures, which is commonly used in like rocket engine, fa rocket fairings. So it's like the outer structure of the rocket. And so I heard you guys use axisymmetric models. Actually, first we're gonna talk about just briefly what is this modeling. It's, I'm not gonna go too in, too, too in detail here, but basically uh, we're modeling this failure mode where you apply pressure loads from the outer atmosphere on the rocket and then in-plane loads because when there's there's the dynamics of the rocket, the the uh, inertial terms cause the uh, face sheet and the core of the, of the rocket structure to be compre in compression. And so what you want to model here is basically what's the critical flaw size of a circular deep bomb This can happen when, you know, there's some damage or there's a manufacturing error. Part of the structure is compromised and you want to predict uh, basically how large can the flaw be before it's going to fail. So that's basically that. Oops, again, wrong. And so we, we can build an axisymmetric finite element model. This is kind of a diagram of the model. You have your boundary conditions correct and your loading. You can actually run this in Abacus, by the way. And what you do is you set up a crack along the circular D bonds. And acts, this is an axisymmetric model. So you're looking at like, uh, if you rotate it, like you're looking at uh, one slice through the circular D bond. And you're trying to predict this thing called the energy release rate which basically tells you how fast when you grow the crack does, does it gain energy and that's really can tell you basically when uh, the crack is at a critical flaw size. And here's an example of a three. I didn't have any pictures of my axis metric models at the time, so I'm just showing you some three dimensional models of crack growth, debond, phase sheet debonding. And what you can see is basically the uh, deformations near the crack and the f final element can basically tell you energy release rate if you want to film that matter you want to just ask a question to you um, yeah why are you modeling why are you modeling pressure inside the core uh what kind of applications that's looking at and why this is important yeah so the reason why there's like so in a rocket structure basically or, uh, or an airplane, right? yeah or an airplane so when the rocket structure ascends or descends it's going to have some trapped pressure inside the structure and uh when you so actually it has a certain amount of pressure out at the ground and then when you but it's a closed structure when you ascend there can be some holes to release some pressure but it's not going to release the pressure that quickly and so it has this trap pressure inside of the structure whereas the atmosphere drops in pressure as you as you go as you go up in the air so there's this internal pressure pressing up on the face sheet of the sandwich structure that can cause it to, to, to bulge out and, and fail so that's basically what we're modeling here I can go too much into the weeds with it, but you know, in this case, I was trying to this this doesn't use machine learning or anything like that. I was just doing some math to get a design curve. So I'm not going to go too much into it, but some interesting things here for you guys is like uh, there's I've chosen a mode shape and basically I use an energy method, kind of like very similar to what FDA does, but it's like a simplified really risk form, you know. Um, and then we try and um, optimize the mode shape parameters to predict the failure. And it's basically like an approximate method that's supposed to match the FBA. And we use it in this case, I use the FBA models to kind of build a surrogate model to then actually, it's not actually that easy to run crack growth models during an optimization for instance, for demand. So um, yeah, basically you you take this total potential energy and based on the loading and the mode shapes that you assume, and you get this, these analytic expressions for the energy release rate. And then you can use a rate of method to determine what mode shape parameters are occur at the minimum energy state. 
And then you can develop a design curve, which can tell you basically uh, if I have this loading, these loading conditions, and this geometry, like what's my critical flaw size, basically, and you can predict that kind of failure. So uh, now for kind of the cooler section probably is um, basically structural optimization of aircraft structures. So I have two pictures of some CAD geometries that I made recent, or a few months ago. Um, for some design problems. Basically, um, I'm going to go over first like a little bit about buckling. So I'm assuming you guys know a little about buckling. Basically, it's a generalized eigenvalue problem. You know, you have to solve. Um, you're basically solving for if I increase my buck, my my mode or my deflections by this linear scalar amount, and also what the deflection mode shape is. Um, when does structural instability occur? And then, because once the inst once you get an instability point, uh, the deflection can grow really high, and then you have buckling failure, basically, and really high stresses as well, usually. So there are some instances where buckling uh, can actually be helpful if you buckle, you know, that don't, it doesn't become catastrophic, but that's kind of an edge case when I'm talking about that. So in general, you want to avoid buckling failure. Uh, this is from a paper that I'm working on right now, basically, Stiffen panel buckling. So you see like a stiffen panel here it has some in plane loads, axial and shear loads on it. And uh, you take, and there's two, uh, two of the example failure modes are shown on the right of the global axial mode, where basically the, the plate deforms upwards in kind of a circular hump shape. And the shear mode is kind of more diagonal. That's kind of characteristic of the shear mode shape. Um, and then I can use, so I, here I, I use the, the FEA, an FEA buckling analysis, uh, which again is an eigenvalue problem, so it takes a little bit longer, but you can run a bunch of these models um, across a large region of the design space. You kind of have to understand the equations first, but to do that of some closed form solutions, but then you can basically help them develop a design tool with this or better understand your problem. These, these are all FEA models, and you can, I don't think you guys can see this that well. Can you see the mode shapes or no? I, I don't know why. Okay, well, basically, like this, like axial simply supported modes, shear simply supported modes, not super important. You have to look at in more detail, but basically, a bunch of FEA models, uh, probably important parameters of, of this buckling problem. And what you can do is, uh, again, so the reason why. Uh, let's say you're trying to optimize the design of the aircraft structure. Um, typically, you want on a computer like less than 10 minutes to actually for one design step of the optimization. And so if you throw like a buckling analysis of each panel in there on the aircraft structure, you're way past that limit already, not including other things you might have to do like a CFD analysis. So that's not going to work basically for a opposition that you're going to be able to run on your computer, you know, or like even on an HPC or like, you know, a supercomputer. So what you want to do is basically what I, what I do here is I um, use a machine learning surrogate model trained against all these data. And once you train it, then it, the runtime is like next to nothing. So it's, it's basically pretty helpful um, design optimization. And this is a Gaussian process surrogate model. So you, basically choose a kernel function, which can be chosen kind of based on your data type, whatever problem you're doing. And it will compute a covariance matrix on your data. And then you can learn these weights uh, related to your training data and then use a joint Gaussian process model to extrapolate what the values, what the, what the model should be throughout the rest of the design space. So you can basically get a, a full machine learning prediction curve. And you can see on the top right that it matches the data pretty well. Um, and then some examples of uh, structural optimizations that I've done with this kind of stuff. The ones on the left were with CFD in the loop. Um, if you don't know what CFD is, computational fluid dynamics. Some of you probably, guys probably do know that, but um, I, so I obviously did some other pretty cool stuff here where a professor wrote a code with uh, that can do thermal elastic structural analysis. So it, models not only the elastic response to the wing, but also it can predict the temperatures in response to the heat flux. And we couple the structural analysis of the FEA with the FEA models, you know, of the wing to um, aerodynamic loads and aerodynamic heat fluxes from a CFD 
uh, code, and then and then use an adjoint method, which is a technique that can help compute derivatives a lot faster, basically, to uh, do the optimization. And it gives you like what the thickness of each of the panels should be in the wing. And then here is something that I just started doing recently where I'm like optimizing with buckling constraints as well with the machine learning surrogate model. So, so when I look at this, right, could you describe a little bit about the benefits of finite elements to do optimization and mm -hmm. parametric studies? Because mm -hmm. if you were to do a lot of testing, so you came up with a hundred designs. Yeah. It'll be very expensive to test all hundred designs. Right. So obviously, finite elements is providing something very powerful here. It's giving you the ability to do virtual testing. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about the benefits of finite elements in the design process and optimization? Yeah, so what you kind of mentioned before is that once you validate like one design, you probably sometimes you need to be more than one design case, but you don't just, you don't need to verify like every single model in the design space, right? If you can model a couple, if you can validate a couple of key points in the design space, you have to have a little bit of knowledge of that, but then you can basically use the FEA models to like extrapolate the rest of the, the rest of the data. And so that's for parametric studies. Basically it, it gives you a, a, an ability to run a lot of, to, to basically, you know, get the numerical analysis results for a lot of, a lot of different models that you can then train against really fast. And one of the reasons that again, that's so fast is because uh, when you form the linear equations of the FEA analysis, if it's like a linear analysis, then, it uses because because you're using localized basis functions, the matrix is sparse, and that means that the solving the systems can be way faster than, than like traditional or older techniques. So it's like the fastest way that you can basically solve it. Um, in terms of a design context, again, like it's probably the the, the fastest way to run a to get a, an answer for a general structural analysis on general geometry. Um, so in terms of, and you can also when you want to compute derivatives of the FEA analysis, basically what you're doing is a constrained optimization where you have some objective functions and then you can, the constraint is that the FEA analysis is satisfied at every new design. And so that's a vector of constraints, like you, know, for, you have K times U equals to F where those are vectors. And so you can use this thing called the, the adjoint method, um, which lets you compute, it's kind of like the Lagrange multiplies, if you know what that is but for that vector of constraints, and then you can uh, compute one adjoint analysis. And it's like the probably one of the fastest way that I know of. And I think that's the industry standard for like design, or at least academic standard for design optimization of structures, because it's the fastest way you can solve the general structure analysis problem and also the fastest way to compute the derivatives. So, so, so you can basically use finite elements to optimize your structure using various techniques Mm -hmm. And that allows you to reduce cost when it comes to optimization, mm -hmm. to, to when it comes to design, yep. right? Um, yeah, I want to I want to thank you uh, for talking to us. Um, so hopefully this this lecture uh, inspired you to pursue something in this area.